So again, I just missed to tell you, whenever you are suspecting a CORTI, the you need to send for urine examination and asymptomatic bacteriuria need not be treated or asymptomatic uh, bacteria, or if the patient is not uh, having any fevers, but still the urine is showing some pus cells or the turned out to be positive, there is no need to, cultures turned out to be positive, there is no need to treat such cases. Only cases wherein the patient is having fevers or there is a development of shock, new onset shock in these cases, you need to first change the Foley's catheter and then uh, before changing, you send for the cultures or the urine examination and start on the antibiotics as per your antibiogram. Usually, we start with any fluoroquinolones or piperacillin tazobactam, depending upon the antibiotics. And once the cultures are negative, we de-escalate the antibiotic. <clears throat> then central line associated previous slide. Previous slide. So the coming to the third, the line where central line associated bloodstream infections, you have hand hygiene for all the uh, procedures that you do in the ICU. You have to take contact precautions. You have to wear a gown, a uh, glove, a cap, a mask, and take all the precautions, especially hand hygiene, maximal barrier precautions, chlorhexidine skin antisepsis, optimal site selection. W can anybody tell me which is the best site to put a central line? Any, uh, can you guess or uh, of all the uh, areas, the internal jugular vein, the femoral and the subclavian, which is the best to put a central line and why? And finally, is there a central line necessity in my case is the uh, question. Then next slide. So again, the same thing, the five evidence-based steps in, pre in preventing CLAPSI is use appropriate hand hygiene, use chlorhexidine for skin preparation, use full barrier precautions and avoid using femoral veins because femoral area is the one which is prone for more contamination and more it is a site very near or very near to the peri uh, anal area and they are more prone for contamination and remove unnecessary catheters. Next. So coming to the management of the uh, CLAPSI, first, when you're thinking, you send cultures, one from the central line and one from the peripheral. And when the cultures are flagged positive, at least two hours prior, the central line should grow the same organism as in the blood. You say that the person is having central line associated infection, bloodstream infection. And usually the common organisms, uh, you treat according to the antibiogram. And in our setup, it is the acinetobacter that we usually isolate or uh, sometimes very rare, uh, from the Klebsiella. And the third, very rare is E. coli. So we, we usually get acinetobacter is the first then Klebsiella, then the E. coli. And our acetobacter is usually susceptible to polymyxin, but uh, sometimes the acetobacter, usually when the patient is not symptomatic or there is no shock, um, uh, we go with, if there is meropenem sensitivity, we go with meropenem in these cases. And stages, then coming to the pressure source, you have the staging of the pressure source, the patients, prolonged patients, bedridden patients, all the pressure points have to be taken care of. And there are stages of pressure source that is stage one, which is the redness, which is documented by the sisters every day. They take, they go through all the pressure points, all the pressure areas, and they document. And the second stage two is wherein the dermis is also involved. Stage three, wherein the subcutaneous fat the sore is still the subcutaneous fat and stage four is wherein the bone is also exposed. And these 
the pressure point care is very important again there is every possibility of a bloodstream infection from the pressure source the uh, the stay the length of the stay because of the recurrent infections the length of stay may increase in the patients with who develop pressure sores next so this is the braden risk assessment score wherein sensory or mental is the, you have uh, almost the, the six parameters and the total scoring you go from the sensory or mental that is the mental status of the patient how is the mental status how is the moisture condition uh, that is is he, is his peri perianal areas or other areas are constantly moist and activity is he wheelchair bound is he walking or his mobility how he is moving in and around how is the nutritional status and what is the any corrections that we can do uh, in these cases is uh, are all these six parameters we uh, take into account and we assess we give them a score like in the chart you can see this chart is there in all the case sheets usually you give them a score and 15 to 16 is mild 12 to 14 is moderate risk and less than 12 is high risk and these high risk patients you need to take all the precautions in uh, preventing the pressure ulcers like the air beds the position changes their nutritional aspects the moisture in and around the pressure areas has to be reduced and they have to be mobilized either in the bed or on to chairs at the earliest next 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 so prevention of pressure ulcers is surface make sure your patient have the right support you are inspecting all the areas every day and moving or that is mobilizing the patient in the bed or outside the bed and incontinence or moisture has to be prevented and nutrition and hydration of the patient has to be taken care to prevent the pressure ulcers and once there is a pressure ulcer you have to document the grade of the pressure ulcer as i told you the grading of the pressure ulcer and if it is grade 1 you need to uh, position or position more often take care of the uh, the pressure in the bed air beds and the other hydration and nutritional aspects and see that it gets healed at the earliest and it is like a grade 3 or a 4 you need to involve the either the plastic surgeon or surgeon for the debridement and also send cultures if you are suspecting it as the focus of infection and treat accordingly with the antibiotics early debridement and source correction and sometimes you may need to have a graft as well when once the patient is better or um, in a better condition to accept the graft next so these are the surgical site infections where the patient takes uh, um, uh, this is the bundle to prevent surgical site infection where the patient takes pre operative ba uh, bathing then appropriate surgical antibiotic prophylaxis one hour before the surgery and you use a trimmer for or a clipper for uh, uh, removal of hair and you use hand scrubs hand hygiene is almost in all the preventive bundles and they use correct skin antibiotic antiseptic preparations so these are the surgical site infections and surgical site infections are also graded into deeper and superficial surgical site infections and again there will be a redness there will be a discharge or a pus from the surgical sites and either they have to undergo a debridement or review of the wound or a suture removal or uh, re exploration of the site depending upon the uh, how depth it is and what organs are involved it can itself uh, curtail to the skin around the uh, around the surgical area or it may be deeper uh, into the organs it may be as deep as involving the organs so the preventive part is the antibiotic prophylaxis 
just before one hour before the surgery is very important and pre operative bathing showering and uh, hair removal and also <clears throat> the uh, uh, not not to see that the contamination is prevented at the surgical site is very important next so the coming to the antibiotic stewardship other i have discussed about the vap i have discussed about corti i have discussed about clapsi surgical site infections then with the coming to other infections which can be prevented like a c diff wherein usually the nurse comes to you saying that he's having your patient is having two to three stools which are common in an enterally treated patient in an icu if there is an increased stool uh, the content or there is it is foul smelling or there is a temperature rise or the tlc is rising and he's been on antibiotics like clindamycin or a cephalosporins for a longer duration you should suspect c diff clostridium difficile and antibiotic stewardship is one of the best ways to prevent c diff in your um, icus and these the enhancing infection these are the core elements of antibiotic stewardship that is enhancing infection prevention and control all these steps the bundles are nothing but the prevention and control controlling the source of infection that is uh, 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 like a abscess you have somewhere and you're continuously giving antibiotics without drainage is not no is not the way the things are in a correct way you have to drain the abscess that is the source control is very important and prescribing antibiotics when they are truly needed and appropriate antibiotic and dosage duration all these things play a vital role in uh, antibiotic stewardship and preventing drug resistant antibiotic uh, drug resistant multi drug resistant organisms in your patient and reassessing whenever you send a culture you as a de escalate depending upon the cultures and culture sensitivities and you have to uh, support supporting surveillance recurrent uh, very often the team should assess that the antibiotics uh, are going in a correct as per the antibiotic stewardship or antibiotic policy of the hospital whenever there is an escalation of antibiotic a form needs to be written and submitted or justified that why i have started on a particular higher antibiotic in my patient and it is the education of the staff and interdisciplinary approach it involves all the physicians it's not just the icu physician or the physician or um, the other uh, staff but the entire interdisciplinary approach is required in following the antibiotic stewardship and preventing some of the infections or multi drug resistant infections in your patients like a c diff which is also because of the antibiotics or a prolonged antibiotic usage next so we have discussed many of the infections we have uh, some other uh, infections like uh, acalliculus cholecystitis uh, is are also common in uh, icus because of the stasis uh, paralytic areas uh, mobilization of organisms from the gut all these are important but the core or the important um, icu infections have been discussed the standard precautions have been discussed now coming to the environmental factors the high quality cleaning and disinfection of all the patient care areas are to be checked the environmental protective agent should be used like a detergents or dis disinfectant disinfections which uh, they have to be used uh, very meticulously and needs including pathogens that survive for long periods so these things like a vre or resentobacter c diff and norovirus are very common are, uh, are ic useful of resentobacter or a vre and c diffs so these particularly uh, the approved disinfectants and or detergents should be used and frequency how often do we use these the surface cleaning the all the surfaces have to be cleaned twice weekly at least for cleaning two to three times per day and terminal cleaning that is once a patient is transferred from one bed to the uh, either to the ward or there is a death 
you have to uh, do the terminal cleaning that all the equipment, the, blood, uh, the bed, the railings, the mattress, everything in and around that particular bed had to be cleaned after the discharge or movement of the patient from that particular bed. So you need to see all this where, and you need to be vigilant and see that these things, the surface cleaning, the floor cleaning and the terminal cleaning takes place. Next. So organization, if I'm good, it doesn't mean I need to be supported by the organization and administration. So they have to maintain the patient to nurse ratio. If, if the patient is on one ventilator, one is to one ratio. And if they are non-ventilator, at least one, one nurse for two patients is, is acceptable. And controlling traffic flow to and fro from the unit and waste and sharp disposable policy, that is biomedical waste, education and training of the staff, ICU protocols for prevention of nosocomial infections, audit and surveillance of infections and infection control policies, an infection control team and antibiotic stewardship and vaccination of all, all healthcare personnel is very important. Next. So architectural layout is also important. So your ICU should be, where should it be? It should be either close to OT or ER and away from the main ward areas and recirculation air must pass through the appropriate filters. Air should be filtered to 99% efficacy and minimum of six total air changes per room per hour with two air changes per hour composed uh, of outside air and clearly demarcated routes of traffic flow, how the traffic should flow from in and out and usually preferably two doors adequate spaces like 2.5 to 3 meters of between the beds and adequate number of all call scrubs at each bed outside the icu and at each nursing stations adequate wash basins and toilets and separate medication preparation area separate areas for clean storage and soiled and waste storage and disposable electricity air vacuum outlets or connections should not hamper access around the bed. These are all the architectures, architectural and layouts of ICU whenever you plan for an ICU, which are also a part of infection control. Next. So these are the ICU bundles we have displayed every time at like a corti. It's very, the seven steps, aseptic precautions, secure the catheter, euro bag below the bladder, empty the bag, then all these clapsy, then VAP, pressure ulcer, positioning second hourly. So we have a chart wherein the, all the patients are positioned to the right at 10 o'clock, to the left at uh, uh, 12 o'clock. And in between uh, like two o'clock, you have them in the uh, supine position, like back care and how often it should be given, frequent checking and changing of diapers, frequent check of alpha beds and nimbus beds frequent checking of urinary catheter. That's how you, pre you, these are the bundles and these are displayed in all the ICUs and care areas of the hospital. Next. So the important take home message is it all starts with you. You should have a very good knowledge of infection prevention. What is, what has caused this particular infection in my patient? You have to do an audit to yourself and answer why this patient has developed a VAP. Is there a delay in removing the line? Is there a, a, a sepsis followed during putting the line or handling the line? Where the things went wrong? And you have to ultimately audit yourself a very good knowledge of all these prevention bundles and the knowledge educating your staff and also you updating yourself with the prevention bundles and management will yield a very good outcome in terms of mortality and morbid morbidity of all the ICU patients. Thank you.